uh, we are really excited that we have Lucas Smith coming in. Uh, he's all the way from Zurich, by, not by plane, but train. Um, so he came in yesterday, we're really excited that he came over. Uh, I think he, it's, it's a great introduction, a good start of the day to tell us more about diversity and inclusion. Uh, yesterday I was the only women on stage, it was a bit sad. Today we have four, so we're going to get better. Uh, and Lucas will tell us more about why it's important and uh, how you can uh, all work on it and uh, uh, increase it. So please come up to the stage. Lucas, welcome. <laughs> Give him a big applause. Okay. Good morning. Um, it's great to be here. Um, that's actually my video will not play as smoothly inside the presentation as just now. So let's. I'm starting with the video. So let's uh, uh, get the video full screen. Okay, Noel, you try it. I'm to Johan. Two black. Two black. So we're yeah. seeing a video. Come on, come on. Come on. Somebody with a white complexion, they get soap from a soap dispenser. And somebody with a black, they don't, right? And then they apply the life hack of using a white tissue. Uh, and voila, they get soap. Right? I mean, that's. That is a, a, a racist machine, right? <laughs> And once again, with a dark complexion, no soap. Right. So I just wanted to start with this short video. Um, and let's, uh, sorry, it's going to load a little bit. Um, because I wanted to highlight that our actions can be racist. They can be a form of harassment, even though we are not racist. Right. And I think that's a very, very important thing that especially privileged people should uh, start to realize, right? So, um, so the creators of this soap dispensers, were they racist? I don't know for sure, um, but probably not, right? Um, but nonetheless, maybe it was an accident, right, that they just didn't think of looking for different skin complexions, and most likely the team was just comprised of people with a white complexion, right? So they didn't thing to test about it, right? Um, well, you know, now, you know, I'm calling it a racist soap dispenser, right? And that uh, in many situations when people accidentally do something, or, you know, behave in a way that is harassment or that is racist and so on and so forth, they will say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not racist. How could you, how can you insinuate that I would do something that is racist, right? But clearly, as this example shows, it's very, very possible to do something that is, in fact, racist or problematic in some way. Um, so how should they react when, they, when somebody points this out to this engineering team? So the obvious thing, you know, they should not become defensive. They should fix the issue. You know, that's, that's the, probably the first thing they should do. Um, and they should make sure it doesn't happen again. And so essentially, um, I'm, I'm actually questioning, do you, can you call this an accident? Like, it was your job to build a soap dispenser for humans, right? And they obviously failed to deliver that, right? So this is, they, they decided not to care about a large portion of humanity, right? And um, so, yes, it might be an accident, but, um, but maybe they just didn't care enough to actually look at all of humanity. Um, and let me give you another example. In, um, so I'm from the symphony community, um, and I was, two years ago, I uh, ended up being appointed diversity lead. Um, and half year before that, I actually started to actually, you know, um, look a little bit deeper at this topic. And so we were at the award ceremony, and, um, and we had these various awards, and one of them was, um, for, I think, for community award, and it says, thanks, dude. Um, and when I saw that award, I was like, and I, I was just, got, just got appointed to diversity lead, and you know, I was in that room now actually looking with that hat on, um, and I was like, oh my God, I just remember 
like the, the thing that we see on the left, that is the badge we give every new community member when they join on Symphony Connect, which is a requirement to be able to go to uh, Symphony conferences. Now, that's how you register. So this was how we welcomed every person into the community with a hey dude uh, badge, right? And in that moment, I was like, oh my god, we need to fix this, right? It took a, you know, a couple days to get it fixed once I raised it, right? But again, like, we weren't trying to push out anyone, but in fact, we were, right? Um, and uh, so again, this is, you know, accidents happen because we didn't think about it, right? And that was a choice, right? Um, so I would actually argue many of the mistakes and, and accidents happen because we choose not to educate ourselves. We choose not to care enough uh, to actually include people. Uh, so it's not that people are not choosing to join us, maybe, from marginalized communities. It is that we show them we don't care that if they are there or not. Um, so I think, and I hope this is one of the key messages I want to get out uh, in this talk. And, and obviously, um, uh, I'm addressing here the people in, in the privileged positions that do have a position of power, so to say, is that when somebody points out something offensive that you have done, um, then just listen, learn, and then move on, right? Don't make a big deal out of it by trying to defend why you did the thing that you did, just learn it, you know, move on from there. Um, so maybe to make it even a little bit more personal, um, so I always considered myself to be a nice person. Um, I was very, very sure I'm not part of the problem. I, I did acknowledge that I might not be, have been doing as much as I possibly could to try to improve the situation with diversity and inclusion, but I, I was very sure I wasn't part of the problem, right? And as you know, I just illustrated, I was part of a community uh, and I was in a very high position in that community as part of the core member team. Um, and you know, I welcomed people into our community with thanks dude, right? Now, uh, I married a few years ago uh, an engineer um, and uh, the story she was telling me from work, I mean, I thought that the situation wasn't good, but you know, Basically, on average, once a week, she would tell me a sexist joke that you know, was told to her, and then somebody would lean over, touch her arm, and say, you know, you know, I'm just, you know it's just a fun joke, right? You know, I'm, I'm not serious, right? And that, that, that's, that's normality for her in, uh, in an engineering position. So uh, I think that made me uh, think that I would have to become more active. There was another thing that where you know, I finally started to do something, and that was I think two or maybe three years ago, I think it was three years ago, um, there was a symphony event in the US. Uh, so symphony, the community in the US is much, much smaller. Um, so the events there are maybe 50 to 100 people. And there was an all male lineup of speakers. And it was called out on, on Twitter. And you know, my first reaction was, yeah, but the community is still so small. We just don't have any men, uh, I mean, any women in that community yet. And you know, we're just building up. And somebody on, on Twitter was like, no, that's not a valid, that's not a valid reason. I, I'm calling you out on this. And then finally, with, you know, uh, with all the things that my wife had been telling me, I said, yes, yeah, this, this is not acceptable. We need to work on this. And so I decided to become active. Um, and so this was very, very recent. Um, so two years, two and a half years ago. Um, and so with this talk, I really want to also instill a sense of urgency, especially with the people from the more privileged group, that it is not just enough to be a nice person. Um, you actually need to become active. You need to educate yourself, um, and you need to change behaviors to become more inclusive. Um, so throughout this talk, I will also give some definitions. Um, uh, it's great if you can remember them, but again, the most important one is listen, learn, move on, and uh, you know, a sense of urgency. So diversity is in the title of the talk. Um, so basically, it's about the difference uh, in a, within a given setting. Um, and there are many, many dimensions uh, that you can look at. Gender is one that is being talked about a lot. Age is another one. Race is another one. Socioeconomic backgrounds. There are endless amounts of dimensions to look at. 
um, because we are all a little bit different, right? Everyone has some different aspect. Now, in this talk, and actually oftentimes when people talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, gender is probably the main one that is being mentioned. Um, and I just briefly want to explain why that is the case. So I think a pretty obvious one is that 50% of the population you know, is of one gender or identifies with one gender and 50% and, uh, with the other. So it's, you know, it's just very, very obviously there. The other one is that there are no socioeconomic excuses we can put up um, uh, that you know, would explain a disparity, right? So if we say somebody in a wheelchair, we'll say, yeah, well, we couldn't afford the ramp or there are not that many, so we didn't think about it, right? With women, 50% you know, on this planet on hum of humans are women, um, and uh, there is no additional cost in that sense, and so on. So all the excuses that are being brought forth basically fall flat, and we just get the real, uh, you know, the real sense of how much injustice there is. Um, so, but again, all dimensions are important, and I don't want to marginalize, marginalize communities. Uh, um, let me give you another example uh, you know, from the world of Apple. So Tim Cook uh, released the Apple Watch, and it was introduced as an intimate health device, health tracking device specifically, right? Um, and what was sort of, to me, very surprising with this device is that it didn't track, uh, you know, it didn't have any capability for tracking the menstrual cycle. Um, and it is kind of, surprising because, in fact, tracking the menstrual cycle is the oldest form of health tracking in humanity. It actually predates the calendar, right? And there's no special sensors that, per se, you need for just, you know, the simple tracking of the menstrual cycle. We're not talking about, like, measuring temperature or something. Just that simple thing, and they chose to omit it. Um, and, uh, and that's... So in, in Watch Series 2, they finally added that capability. And uh, I found this, found this article talking about this surprising jump in women buying uh, the Watch, Watch 2 series, you know. And they don't mention the fact that Apple finally introduced menstrual tracking cycles into that version of, of the Apple Watch. So it, it doesn't occur to the author that there could be a correlation, and to me, I, I don't have final proof of it, but it seems plausible uh, that basically Apple was choosing to not build a device for women uh, where it was a trivial thing to do, and they instead you know, invested a lot of time on building fancy sensors um, uh, to, to attract a male audience. So you know, not building for diversity is not just not right, it's also not good business, I would argue. Um, so another definition, inclusion, also was part of the title. And uh, inclusion is actually the more important aspect. Um, so diversity, uh, you know, is basically, you know, we look at it as a KPI. Uh, how many women do we have in the room? How many men do we have in the room? How many people above 40? How many people below 40? And things like that. But it doesn't talk about how much they are actually integrated and welcome to participate to bring in their cap uh, knowledge, their ideas, their concerns. And that's where inclusion comes in. It's really about how we invite people to participate. Um, so diversity without inclusion is worthless. It actually is kind of worse. Like if we say, let's get all these people in and then not listen to them, um, that, that's kind of even worse than... Uh, um, so inclusion is the key. And you can, you know, uh, maybe an analogy would be uh, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And, you know, if we have more different types of people dancing on the dance floor, it's much more interesting, um, you know, we get some more dance moves, um, and so on and so forth. So the next one, I used the word privilege already in my talk. Um, so social privilege specifically is basically anything that you didn't do anything to get, right? Um, so, again, ma let's make this a little bit more um, personal. Um, so, uh, for, for me personally, probably the most important career uh, step was becoming involved in open source. Um, it really has, you know, 
really been the way that I've, I've, I've had all my hirings and so on and so forth. Um, and, but why is it that I could you know, get into open source? So, um, you know, as a teenager, I, I got a computer. Um, I, you know, I, I started doing stuff with Linux and, and the PHP and MySQL. Actually, started with Linux mostly for gaming, um, uh, you know, as a gaming server. Um, and so, you know, I, I did that, you know, as a teenager. Um, and sure, uh, you know, I was able to afford a computer, so that was already something. But more importantly, really getting into open source was when I built, started my own company. Um, and so the initial capital uh, of starting my own company, I earned working for my uncle in Switzerland. Um, and since I was living in Berlin originally, like Swiss salaries are quite nice. Uh, so that gave me a nice chunk to start my business. You know, just having, uh, uh, you know, an uncle with a business was a very, very helpful thing. And then also, um, my, my parents were subsidizing my apartment. And if my company would have gone bust, they would have always been there to cover, uh, to cover me and keep me going. So, the risks of, you know, were much, much reduced. I didn't have to take out a loan. I didn't have to fear for, you know, if I, if I can afford food and so on, um, just because of the socioeconomic background of my family, right? So that doesn't diminish what, you know, I've done in the open source community and that has gotten me into a position of privilege, but I, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not something that was possible for many other people with the same capacity, the same motivation, and so on, right? So that is what I call privilege. Um, so the next word I want to define is equity. Um, so equities are basically, um, it's unfair treatment, uh, mostly as a, you know, um, if it was caused by systematic barriers that were not eliminated. Um, so again, um, I was actually, I, I did this talk once before and I was at an event where in order to get into the event, you would have to take stairs downstairs, right? So if there would have been an attendee in a wheelchair, they either would have been, had to be carried or, and I suspect it would have been possible somehow to, through some other route to also get into that uh, area, but it would have been, you know, the first thing that you arrive there is like, uh, who do I contact? Because there wasn't a doorbell or anything. Like, who do I contact to get me into the building, right? Um, so that's not equity. You know, you're not, uh, you're not making it easy for that person to get in or out again, right? Um, and so if, let's, let's do a thought experiment here. Um, so in the Netherlands, think about like how many women are working in IT in the Netherlands. Just think of a number. Um, it's roughly 10%. So this includes open source, proprietary, everything. Roughly 10%. Um, maybe let's think about the US. How many uh, there? Think of a number. It's roughly 20%. Um, in Switzerland, it's roughly 15%. And, and I, I, I mean, I did research on the web, but I, you know, I, I, if the numbers are calculated exactly the same way, I, I cannot guarantee. But I, I, I suspect the ratio will probably be the same even if you do uh, in-depth research on that. Um, so that's, um, that's a surprisingly normal number, especially if you consider that in the 60s and 70s, it was actually a majority women inside IT. Um, so something shifted. Um, one of the things that shifted was that marketing changed. Um, so computer games were, from the very beginning, marketed to men. But more importantly, if a woman, so basically personal computing was a key factor as well. Because, so in the 60s and 70s, computers were things that were filling rooms that you could only get at work, right? And then women were actually in a slight majority. Now with personal computing, those required the ability to make those purchase decisions. And while many women hold a lot of purchase power when it comes to groceries and, and cl clothing and things like that. A purchase of a personal computer, that was something only a man could decide at that time, right? And even if, uh, you know, if it was bought for a child, it was bought for the son, not for the daughter. And that's how those numbers shifted. And that again um, is, you know, definitely not equity. So moving on to open source, what are percentages there? 
think of a number, is it higher or lower than in the proprietary world? So the numbers I just showed you, these were averages across proprietary and, and open source. So it's 2 to 10%, right? So we have the word open and open source. You know, how can, how can this be? Like, obviously, we're not open, right? Or we're not open to all types of people. We might have the source be open, but we're not open to all types of people. And I do realize that in the Drupal community, um, it actually is better. A Drupal tends to be, on average, a little bit better than the general open source community. Um, so I've heard numbers around 15% inside the uh, Drupal community. I, um, but 15% is not something to you know, uh, shout and dance about either. Um, so one of the things that oftentimes I hear people say, well, you know, if women are not doing open source, it's, you know, it's their choice. And I've already explained how maybe it is not a choice. Uh, it is a, you know, oftentimes getting into open source requires some sort of socioeconomic freedom um, to begin with. Now, um, the other thing that people say, well, we'd make decisions based on merit, right? We look at code, and we just look at the hard facts. Is this good code? Is this bad code? Can it be improved? Is this person capable enough to improve the code? And things like that. Now, GitHub did a study, and um, so they looked at how often does code get accepted if it is submitted by a, a male-sounding name? versus a female-sounding name. And female-sounding names def got much lower acceptance rate on their code. Now, what made the study even more interesting, they also looked at uh, people that identify as women, but that are using male-sounding names for their code submissions. And surprisingly, those submissions actually had a higher acceptance rate than the submissions of people with male-sounding names that were identifying as men. So basically, the study proved that if you have a, a female-sounding name, you will get much, much harsher criticism, and your merit will be considered to be lower, regardless of how good your code is. Right? So that study basically threw the idea of meritocracy and open source out of the window. Right? That is just not true. We are obviously not able to judge merit um, at this point in the way that we can claim that this is how we make decisions in open source, right? That's, that's a pretty big thing. Like, if you go to the Apache Foundation, they still have meritocracy as one of their key guiding principles, right? Um, so maybe, again, for, with equity, if you see a, a, a boot camp for women or you see a training for underrepresented people, refugees, and so on. Oftentimes, I get people saying, you know, I, I had it hard as well. Like, I, I, you know, I, I don't have a socioeconomic background that was very strong. And just because I'm a white man, like, why am I being disadvantaged? Um, so what I would say to this is that if you have if you are being marginalized for, because of your background for whatever reason, you know, socioeconomic, then I think you should be helped too. Right? But these boot camps and so on and so forth, they're about creating equity. Right? Um, so don't do whataboutism that you have some problems or something in your past that, that wasn't equitable either um, to use as an you know, excuse to not give that to some other marginalized group. Um, so, and I think it's the last definition I have in my slide deck. So unconscious bias, and I think this is actually a very, very critical topic um, where I hope that some of you will, will start to address this. Um, so cognitive biases are basically um, a human condition where we um, systematically distort uh, the relevance of small details uh, by extrapolating empirical evidence. So they're basically mental shortcuts um, that um, have actually made a lot of sense historically uh, or evolutionary um, by in the hunter-gatherer age when you know, life was a lot more simple and we had to deal with very, very simple problems every day. Uh, um, and they would make our cooperation process and things like that easier. Um, but um, they 
tend to let, uh, have us jump to less than optimal uh, outcomes. And this was not relevant back then, but today, generally, as a humanity, actually providing food is not a, a challenge anymore. That's a, that's a choice if we provide food for everyone or not. What we care about today more, uh, you know, more and more is innovation, right? So we don't want to um, you know, flatten out uh, discoveries uh, by, via unconscious bias. We want to make sure that a new idea has an opportunity to actually be seen as an innovative and beneficial idea. So let me go through some things. So conventional wisdom, um, and actually I'm a, I'm a coach, I play ultimate frisbee, and I play it in a, this is a sport with frisbee discs, it's a team sport, and I play it mixed. And I always had this sense that, you know, I had to, um, uh, for the men, I had to tell them, okay, maybe don't throw so many crazy discs, uh, control it uh, a little bit. And for women, I had to say, come on, be a little bit more confident, you can do it, right? That was always my understanding. But if you actually look at studies, they show women are not less confident than men. They just show it in a different way, right? But we've come to sort of identify how confidence uh, is displayed by how it is usually displayed by men. And again, not even all men display it in the same way. Now, if you're you know, a hiring manager, that's one of the things that a lot of them really like. You look at confidence. So, we get a woman into the room, we interview them. As soon as we don't see that male pattern of confidence, we say, ah, unfortunately, she's uh, one of those women that isn't confident, no match out the door, right? Rather, so basically, the first time we see any behavior that looks like a uh, lack of confidence, um, we already say, okay, unfortunately, she's just not the one. So that is what is called confirmation bias. Now, uh, maybe let's uh, all read this statement up here. So I was typing up notes from one of our scientists when I got a call from my nanny, who was at the door. Upset, I rushed home to be there before the kids got home from school. Now think about the, the person that you know, authored this statement. What is the gender, female or male? The doctor and the scientist in this story, what is their gender, male or female? Most likely you have an image in your head but this story didn't talk about gender of the author, the gender of the doctor, gender of the nanny even, right? But still, we associate quite clearly a gender with each of these uh, characters, right? And that's what's called the gender stereotyping basis. We have a harder time seeing a woman being a doctor. We have a much easier time seeing a woman being a nanny, right? Now, let's go one more experiment. So let's, let's judge Alan and Ben. Um, so, uh, so Alan is intelligent, industrious, impulsive. He's also critical, stubborn, and envious. Um, now we have Ben, he's, he's envious, uh, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious, and intelligent. So who would you hire, right? And that's what's called the halo effect. So since with, uh, um, actually I think the names are reversed here, <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, sorry, so that's a small typo here on the slides. So essentially the idea of the halo effect is that once we've met somebody and we sort of had this first impression of them, then from then on we will always say, well, whatever we see next kind of matches that expression, uh, you know, things that we've seen. So if, we've, if we, the first impression was positive, then we'll keep, you know, noticing all the positive things and we will say the negative things, ah, they don't matter that much, right? And uh, so that's another thing, again, uh, to watch out for. So this slide here actually summarizes the key uh, unconscious biases that are especially relevant for hiring decisions that uh, would keep diversity down. So I've already explained the first three. The next one is affirmation bias. So we just tend to hire people that are like us. So if we have a male-dominated uh, uh, field, then if you know, on average, men will make those decisions. They will tend to hire men. Um, but it works the other way around. So uh, getting a job as a male nurse might also be much, much harder um, because most nurses on average tend to be uh, male, or at least in most countries. I don't know about uh, the Netherlands. Um, the other one is intergroup bias. And this is something that actually at my company, we, we ha I, 
I hope we, actually, I'm not sure if we finally stopped doing this um, after I raised it. Uh, when, in the hiring process, we have a questionnaire and it asks for cultural fit. Um, and I think this is a really a red flag type of question. So cultural fit is, um, many people associate this, if, you know, is this a person I would go out in the evening to have a beer or, you know, play darts with? Um, and oftentimes this is driven by, are they from the same region, geographic region? Do they like the same sports teams? Do they even care about sports, right? And these are things that we apply uh, during an interview where we are actually looking at the professional qualifications where this shouldn't really matter at all, right? Um, but this is, again, is a, a bias that, that tends to uh, hurt diverse hiring. And there are many more uh, such biases. Um, so it's very important. So I call them unconscious. Um, so the first step is making them conscious, and then that is a, a first step towards actually dealing with them um, and avoiding them. So um, the key thing that why I think that they're, again, they're problematic is that um, they actually hurt our ability to think innovatively. So if we get a bigger mix of people into a room um, with more different backgrounds, we will get more ideas. And if we respect them, if we include them in the conversation in a respectful manner, then we have an opportunity to be much more innovative. And what is kind of interesting is that if you have a more diverse workforce, then you will be challenged much often, uh, much more often with different behaviors, different opinions and things like that, even on trivial things. And this will kind of inoculate you a little bit towards those in unconscious biases because it becomes normal that things are not obvious, right? Um, that you have to look at something, that you have to respect a new idea, a different uh, behavioral pattern. One thing that I also thought was interesting in this, this way is that a lot of times when people talk about diversity, they say, okay, from now on we'll just all be holding hands and singing in the circle, right? It, that is not what diversity is about. Um, uh, in a way, diversity is also really pushing us to be better, um, to get better, and when we say better in the workforce, again, we're often talking about being more innovative. Um, so I think one goal for, for, uh, for, for a company, actually, is to make it easy for people to choose discomfort, right? It, it shouldn't be easy, or it is not easy to do things that machines can't do, right? They require, again, innovative uh, thinking. Um, but what is important is that people can choose the amount of discomfort they can uh, deal with on a daily basis, that they can regroup, uh, they can step back, um, you know, and ensure their mental health uh, and uh, long-term sustainability. So how do we improve? Um, so we get to the second part of the talk. Um, and actually, maybe I, I have a small task for every one of you. So I'm going to list a bunch of things. Please try to remember one or two of these things and really challenge yourselves for the next couple weeks to actually implement them so that they become standard behavior. So the first one you're actually doing right now, you're, you're starting your journey on educating yourself on the topic. Uh, you could continue on that. Um, and there are actually plenty of your resources, and that's actually also a classic. When I became lead of the diversity initi initiative, my first instinct was like, I'm just going to walk up to every woman or representative of a marginalized community and ask him, you know, why, isn't things, why aren't things perfect yet, right? That's, that's a very bad idea, right? Because if they're at a conference, for example, they're not here to educate me on, uh, on diversity. They're here to learn about technology and things like that, right? So that's, that's one of the first lessons that I learned once I started to educate myself. And there are plenty of resources on the web. Um, you know, just type in diversity and inclusion and you'll get plenty of very good information. Next one is, uh, Consider following people from marginalized communities. So, for example, on Twitter, I usually wait like two or three tweets from a person until I finally follow that person. Um, I've made it a, a pattern now that if I see a tweet from somebody that uh, appears to be part of a marginalized community and it looks interesting, I'm going to follow that person on the first, first time I see them. And that's really because if I look at my you know, demographics in, my, in the people that I was following, there was a very clear demographic there. And so I was not hearing the realities of a large portion of the community. And uh, so that, that really helped me uh, 
on my path to hopefully becoming a better ally. Um, challenge your cognitive biases, um, really work on that. There are trainings around this. There's a really good video from Google um, and several other resources on the web uh, that can really help you in you know, becoming aware of them and how to deal with them. Another thing is that if you hear a story, one of those uh, many, many horror stories specifically, oftentimes if you're not part of that marginalized community, you're like, ah, it's probably not so bad, right? I mean, you're just, that's just an extreme, you know, most people are not racist, they're not sexist, and so on and so forth. I would advise you to maybe believe them um, because it is much, much, uh, you know, it's, it's, or let's say it's very, very easy to discount them as not normal patterns. And again, I was doing things like this, um, and I, pro I might still be doing things like this, you know, just because I'm not aware yet, right? Um, and, uh, and again, the, the thanks dude example, it's now, it's blatantly obvious it's when I point it out, right? Um, but I would have never thought that I was doing something like this until, you know, uh, it was finally uh, shown to me. Um, so, so try to do that. Um, then when you're in a hiring meeting, don't think about if this person works and thinks like me, look at what do they add to the team that we don't yet have in our company, right? That is the type of question you should ask yourself, right? How does this advance the scope of ideas available to us as a team? Um, remove optional items from job ads. If you're part of a marginalized community, you've already experienced most likely that you're less, your chances of getting hired are much lower. So if you see optional items that you don't fulfill, you are more likely not to apply. So just throw them out. You can still uh, figure that out during the interview process if you need to know if they have these optional criteria, but focus on the hard criteria um, in the job ad itself. Um, also review the language in job ads. So what is quite interesting is there are certain words, if you use them in a job ad, they are very, um, they're much, much more likely to attract uh, a male audience. Um, but the interesting thing, if you remove those words, if you reword your statements, um, and there are various ways to do this, and there are resources on the web for this, um, then the interest of, uh, uh, of men does not go down, it's just that for example, for women, it also becomes a relevant job ad. So Rockstar and Coding Ninja, for example, these are one of the classic examples. Um, and just generally try to use more inclusive language. Um, and this is very hard. Some langu languages also just make it very hard. Uh, so for example, I'm, I'm, I'm a native German. Uh, we just gender everything. Um, and uh, so for example, in English, I can say, partner, right, and then in a situation where it doesn't matter if I'm, I'm married to a man or a woman, in German the appropriate thing would be partnerin, so I would already gender uh, the partner word, so there's no real good way of doing it non-gendered. Um, but that's something I generally advise. Try to phrase your sentence, especially if you write, in a way that if gender matters, sure, include it. If gender doesn't matter, phrase the sentence in such a way that you don't even talk about gender at all. Um, another thing you can do is you can um, announce your pronouns on your, on your signatures, on, on Twitter, email, and so on and so forth. Um, so many situations, and actually we just had a situation like that on the Symphony Slack, where a person with a female sounding name was talking about the fact that uh, they had a girlfriend, right? And then a whole debate started about uh, some person starting to label that person's sexual preferences and, 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 and trying to figure out if, if, if Lynn was a woman or a man uh, in that situation. And don't do that, right? You can announce your pronouns to normalize the idea of people uh, announcing their pronouns. Don't assume other people's pronouns uh, as much as possible. And that's something that also I'm still working on. I'm, especially when I speak English, I try very hard to if I don't know the, the pronoun of that person, they, they, they have not announced it to me. I just use they for singular. And another thing, I'm a very, I, I, I have opinions about a lot of things. I, um, I like to speak about a lot of things. 
And so in discussions, I'm really trying hard to throttle myself. So oftentimes somebody says half a sentence and I already have a great idea, at least I personally think it's a great idea, and I'm very, very, very anxious to spout it out right away. And so, you know, if I, there are five people in discussion, then I'm still doing every second sentence. Um, so that's not a good idea um, in, in a way. Um, so I really have to work on, like I personally have to work on just holding my thought and maybe somebody else in the room has the same thought and give them the opportunity to say it. But more interestingly, maybe somebody has a different thought um, that I wouldn't hear if I just keep talking all the time. And um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, if somebody points out that you've done a statement that is offensive, don't become defensive, rather listen, learn, and move on. Um, another thing, um, make sure to uh, point out contributions, especially from, uh, from co-workers that are part of marginalized communities. So I've had plenty of meetings where whenever it was, a, a, you know, a customer would point out if a, you know, a man did something great, they would say that person's name. And if, you know, a woman w has done something, they would still choose to mention a man or they would just attribute that to the team, right? Really make sure to highlight um, if somebody from a marginalized community within your team did something, make sure that your customer hears that um, and really just normalize that. And don't put it onto that, the person from the marginalized community to have to point that out. Um, um, do that, if, especially if you're in a position of privilege. Um, and then another thing is that I have also often seen, and so when we're talking about cognitive bias, overcoming them, you know, getting towards innovation, we need to open the space for innovative ideas. And oftentimes I see if, if you know, a new idea comes in, then uh, you know, people react very quickly. Oh, we've never done it this way. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's a strange way to look at it. Why would you even consider this? Um, so maybe approach is slightly different. If it's new, think about, is it safe enough to try? So even if you've never heard this way of doing it, look, think quickly about the risk if the risks are you know, manageable, maybe see how it plays out um, and give that new perspective uh, some space. So I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, let me summarize the key takeaways. Um, so, um, so diversity uh, is not only a question of justice, it actually also helps you understand your customers. Uh, cognitive biases hurt innovation and you can actually do something to fight cognitive biases. Um, Diversity actually also helps you to overcome them. Um, generally, listen, learn, move on, educate yourself. And there are plenty of things that you can actually do to become active, to become an ally, to make it easier for people from marginalized communities to be, to be welcomed and included. Um, but it does require effort. It is not enough to be just a nice and polite person. So what's the next steps after this talk? Um, so you can reach out via email or Twitter to me personally. Um, there is a, actually a Drupal diversity initiative. Uh, the website is there. There are really, really good articles also in the, collected on that site. So if you want to do further reading, I encourage you to visit that. And there's also a diversity and inclusion Slack channel uh, on the Drupal Slack uh, to join. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you have a great day today on the community day. And Hopefully, you can actually already implement some of the ideas today and going forward uh, for the next weeks. Thank you.